morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. So glad to see all of you guys here. If you haven't already, don't forget to fill out one of our connection cards right in front of you in the pew. That's just so we can stay updated with all of your information and get you plugged in where you want to be. And if you have any prayer requests, don't forget to fill out one of those cards in front of you as well. Whether it be for a family member, a friend, your dog, whoever it may be, fill out one of those prayer requests and drop those off in the offering plate in the back. We love to pray for you guys. Just a few announcements before we get started. And the first one is coffee time is back and running. We are so excited to have donuts and all of the good things every single Sunday at 10 a.m. In between services, don't forget to join us in the fellowship hall. Wait. Hey everybody, just want to remind you that Family Camp is coming up August 19th through the 21st. We only have one spot left for what we've already reserved, but good news, if you run out, you can contact Lake Michigan Camp and Retreat Center and sign up for another tent site, platform tent, cabin, RV site. So we hope to see you up there. It's a great weekend of family and fellowship. Soup Kitchen is looking for your help. They need some juice, one cake, and definitely more volunteers. You can find some more information at the Opportunities Desk, and that's also where you can sign up for this Monday the 8th. They can't wait to see you guys there. Stephen ministry applications are out in the wild. We're so excited to get this ministry up and running again. Reminder, if you have one of those applications, we'd like those back by the second week in August. If you have more questions about this ministry or want to be a part of it, talk to Savannah Tucker and she'd love to get you plugged in and get you an application. Altar Committee is looking for more volunteers. Meg Rogers needs about seven more people to help with Altar Committee. This is a super easy ministry to help with. All you have to do is help change out the pyramids once a month or so um, on the altar and on the podium. So it's super easy. If you want more information about the Altar Committee, what it does, what that would look like for you, or if you want to help with the committee, just contact Meg Rogers or Dan. Thank you so much for being such a helping church. I want to remind all of our high school and middle school friends, we do not have Stoke Youth Group tonight. I hope you all had a great time at Michigan Adventure yesterday. We'll be back again in two weeks. And to all of our pre-K through fifth grade friends, we don't have Spark this week. We will be meeting again next week. I also want to say, as I start to put our 2022-2023 schedule together, I am looking for people to join us as volunteers for both Spark and Stoke. If you would like more information on that or would like to help out, I'd love to sit down and talk to you and get you plugged into these amazing ministries. Okay. There's a ladies' luncheon, August 18th. They're going out for lunch together. It's going to be a great time at Plank's Tavern. If you have more information, check the Opportunities Desk or contact Barb Petsky. Every year, we take a group to the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. This is an amazing mission opportunity. We have some spots available. We spend a couple days down there. We help out building desks, building personal dignity and hygiene kits. And it's amazing to see what this organization is able to do with the generosity of people. If you'd like to go, the trip is September 11th through the 14th. Barb Petsky has more details on that. You can talk to her. Again, this is an amazing trip. We want as many people a part of it as possible. Now let's continue to worship together. I'm sorry, I don't have a cool transition like they've been doing the whole time. <laughs> I don't, I can't do that. That's was fantastic. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I should jump behind the piano and have somebody come out behind us. <laughs> I, I feel unprepared right now. Um, <laughs> welcome, church. Please stand with me as we're about to open today's service. You know, normally as a musician, I, and, and it's been an honor and privilege being able to lead you in worship to start the worship. It's always a blessing for me. It's something I look forward to every time I come. You know, I was thinking about this as I was sitting here watching how cool that video was, but I was thinking, you know, in regards to being a musician and a worship leader, you kind of have that idea baked in. The first song we're doing today is Open the Gates, and you think about that idea of what does that actually mean. A lot of times when you invite somebody into your home, you are always trying to make sure everything's perfect before they come in. But sometimes you have to realize that opening the gates doesn't always mean that what's inside is good or pretty or clean. Sometimes just opening the gates is just something you need to do because we need to invite the Lord in just to be with us. So for fun, I want you guys to help me start this song off. So normally I would do something like a count in for the band, but I actually want you guys to put your hands together with me like this. So it's going to be like this. One, two, one, two, ready, and...
This next song that I, it, it genuinely is one of my favorite songs that we, that I've gotten a chance to do here. And it's called, <laughs> apparently it's yours too. Wow. <laughs> I was overwhelmed by that transition. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Man, you scared me. Okay. <laughs> it's called Overwhelmed. And I, I, I made this talk months and months and months ago. And it's something that I've been praying about and thinking on, and it's that idea of the feeling of being overwhelmed by something. We always tend to put this negative idea on the word overwhelmed, when I'm saying overwhelmed with work, or with life, or with relationships, or with situations. That always means this weight that's on top of me that's pulling me down. And I'm going to ask you, just for one moment, to remove the negative idea of what overwhelm means to you and replace that with an idea of what does it feel like to have an overwhelming sense of blessings being poured upon you, an overwhelming sense of safety, an overwhelming sense of community, an overwhelming sense of love. We can always take control with the help of Jesus Christ and take those negative ideas and change them into something that in a sense is something that I want to be overwhelmed by. So think about that as you sing this song. I see the work 
of your hands galaxies spin in the heavenly dance oh god all that you are is so overwhelming i hear the sound of your voice all that once is a gentle and thundering noise oh god all that you are is so with me dear heavenly father for once we are saying thank you for overwhelming us with things that we don't deserve your love your peace your forgiveness and your son that you sent to die on the cross for our sins lord we run into your arms and we are unashamed because of mercy and we are always grateful and thankful to you lord thank you for waking us up this morning for those who are physically in the room or those who are remote and watching in and those who aren't even here, Lord. Thank you for giving us a breath of life this morning. Please bless the words of Pastor Dan and bless our souls as we go through communion today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I love hearing you say that. <laughs> 
If you've chosen to worship with us in person, we're glad you're here worshiping with us. If you're worshiping online with us, we welcome you as well. And we hope all of you walk away from this uh, worship service together. I hope you walk away from it uh, filled with the Holy Spirit uh, and blessed by the message, blessed by the music. Um, I want to give a quick shout out. I thought the video today was great for the announcements, and I'm so glad they're giving them instead of me because they do a better job. So good job, Savannah. Good job, Will. I do have one correction, though, that Will asked me to make. There is Spark Kids Club this Thursday. He got the weeks mixed up, so there will be our midweek kids club for kids that are ages 4 through 5th grade at 6 o'clock this Thursday for the games, Bible lesson, snacks, all that stuff. So uh, parents, grandparents, if you have kids that are part of that, just make sure you're aware that that is this Thursday. Um, all right, I don't have any other announcements. Oh, I don't want to dismiss the kids to Children's Church. So kids, you are dismissed to go to Children's Church at this time as well. Um, and uh, we'll let you guys know, too, that we're going to do things a little bit different today. During communion, when it comes time, I'll, I'll announce it, but um, during the communion song, um, we're going to invite you to come up and receive the elements here at the um, communion rails. So just know that you can come and, and, and partake during that time. All right, let's get into today's scripture passage. Um, today's scripture passage comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. I'm going to be reading from the uh, Common English Bible, and it says this. Even though my letter hurt you, I don't regret it. Well, I did regret it just a bit, because I see that the letter made you sad, though only for a short time. Now I'm glad, not because you were sad, but because you were, because you were made sad enough to change your hearts and lives. You felt sadness so that no one was harmed by us in any way. Godly sadness produces a changed heart and life that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But sorrow under the influence of the world produces death. Look at what this very experience of godly sadness has produced in you. Such enthusiasm. What a desire to clear yourselves of blame. Such indignation. What fear, what purpose, such concern, what justice. In everything, you have shown yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it wasn't for the sake of the one who did wrong or for the sake of the one who was wronged, but to show you your own enthusiasm for us in the sight of God. And because of this, we, are in, we have been encouraged. Before we dive into this scripture passage, I just want to take a moment and just ask you one question. Have you ever experienced sadness? I think everyone here could probably raise their hand, right? Maybe it was a breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend back in high school or college days or some, some, sometime in life. Maybe somebody said something that hurt your feelings and made you sad. Maybe you wanted to go with this group of friends and do something, but you weren't invited, and that made you sad. Maybe you did or said something that hurt a loved one or a friend or hurt a relationship, and you're, you're sad because of the consequences of your own words and actions. Maybe you've lost a loved one, and that has brought great sadness to your heart. I can remember in high school, I tried out for the uh, uh, basketball team, and I didn't make the team, and most of my friends did. And I can remember that making me sad, and I can remember being a youth pastor, talking with kids who had similar experiences, trying out for something and not making it or not getting that part, and, and, um, and, and you know, how the disappointments make us sad. Let's be honest, we live in a fallen, broken world, living amongst fallen, broken people. And there are going to be things that are done and said and experiences that are going to cause us to be sad. Today's scripture passage has many things to say about sadness. So let's spend some time in God's word today. This passage starts out talking about a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that caused them hurt and sadness. So what letter did Paul write to the, first Corinth, to the Corinthian church that brought this hurt and this sadness? Some scholars believe it's the book that we have in our Bible, the first Corinthians. 
Um, but most scholars actually believe it's another letter that he wrote them, um, trying to correct a certain person's behavior or how to handle a problem within the church. Um, also probably cor tried to correct some theology. Um, that Paul felt some bad theology was being taught, and, and that needed to be corrected. Um, but we don't know what this letter was. It's been lost to antiquity if it did exist. And, uh, but anyway, we know that Paul wrote a letter to these people. And he spoke the truth to them in love. And he, and he wrote it even though he knew it might cause some hurt, some sadness. It might even hurt his relationships with, his relationship with them. But he wrote it anyway because he knew they needed to hear these truths. And to me, that's a sign of a good leader. A good leader cares more about your relationship with God and you developing a biblical faith than he does worried about, do they like me or not? So I commend Paul for this. He put his relationship with these people on the line to speak truth into them, knowing that this truth might cause some hurt and some sadness. But he did it anyway, and that's good. You can see in verses 8 and 9, Paul says, Even though my letter hurt you, I don't regret it. Well, I did regret it just a bit, because I see that the letter made you sad, though only for a short time. However, now I am glad, not because you were sad, but because you were made sad enough to change your hearts and your lives. Paul is not happy that he hurt their feelings and made them sad, but he's glad that this thing that made them sad brought about a change of heart and a change in the way that they lived for the better. Paul then goes on to say that these people had experienced what he calls godly sadness, or some translations say godly sorrow, which led them to repentance and a change in their actions and in their lifestyle. Let me ask you, have you ever had a family member or a friend who told you the truth even though they knew you wouldn't like it? Maybe a tense situation arose between you and another person and, and you had this heated exchange and you, at the end you kind of thought your friend would take your side and instead you know, they say, you know what, you were kind of a jerk to that person. What you did wasn't cool. Or, I don't approve of it. What you did was inappropriate. And you may not like what your friend said at that moment to you. But the more you think about it, the more you realize that they were right, that you didn't handle that situation correctly. You were too mean and too harsh with your words, or maybe you went over the top with your response and your actions. And the next time you get in that tense situation, you actually controlled your language. You remain in control of your emotions, and you handle the situation much better. If you've ever done that, you've experienced what, what, the, what Paul, Paul would say is godly sadness that leads to good change. Another example of godly sadness, when you sin. When you sin, I hope the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. And the things that you did or said wrong, I, pray, I, pray, I hope it makes you sad. And I hope you experience godly sadness. Or when you do something wrong and a friend or family member calls you out on it, I hope you experience godly sadness. It's kind of strange for a pastor to wish godly sadness upon his congregation. Because I really don't want you to be sad. I want you to be filled with the love and joy of the Lord. But when we do wrong, when we say or do something wrong, I hope the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts and it leads to godly sadness. Why do I wish this? Because Paul tells us in verse 10 that godly sadness produces a changed heart. It produces a changed life. He even says it, it produces a life that leads to salvation. A life that leads to no regrets. I want your godly sadness to lead to a changed heart. I want your godly sadness to lead to a changed life. I want your godly sadness to lead you to repentance and salvation through grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I want you to seek forgiveness for the things you've done and said that are wrong. Repent of those bad ways and change your ways and begin to seek to do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord. 
I hope it leads to change of actions. So that when you look back at your life, you have no regrets for how you lived your life. When you look back at the tough situations in life, may you have no regrets for the way you handled them or the way that you corrected them when you realized you were wrong. In verse 10, Paul points out a very important truth. We've already hit the first part that he talks about in verse 10. Godly sorrow leads to changed hearts and lives. It leads to salvation and life. But then he also points out this other important truth. But sorrow under the influence of the world produces death. Worldly sadness leads to death. Worldly sorrow makes us sad. It makes us depressed. How many people in our world are dealing with depression because they're allowing worldly sadness to rob them of joy, to suck the joy of life out of them? Paul says worldly sadness leads to death. It makes us sad. It makes us depressed. It sucks joy out of our lives. It lowers our self-esteem and self-worth. Sometimes it makes us feel like nobodies. It makes us feel like screw-ups. Nothing but a screw-up. It robs us of the joy-filled life that God wants us to have and to experience here on earth. And worldly sadness often, most of the time, hurts our relationship with God, our relationship with family, friends, and others. Let me make this important side note here. Godly guilt and worldly guilt work the same way as godly sadness and worldly sadness. If you do something wrong and you feel guilt and shame afterward and that guilt and shame leads you to repent of your sins and to change your ways and puts inside you a desire to do what is good and right, then that is godly guilt. However, if you do something wrong and you feel guilt and shame afterwards and that guilt and shame pushes you away from God because you don't feel like you're worthy to be in a relationship with God, or it pushes you away from family and friends who love you and care about you and are willing to walk that road with you, because you don't feel like you're worthy of those relationships. That is not godly guilt. That is guilt. That is worldly guilt. That is Satan working on you, trying to make you feel guilty and ashamed and pushing you away from God and pushing you away from all that is good in your life. If your guilt and shame lead you into depression or give you a low self esteem of yourself, that is worldly guilt. God wants you to know that you're precious, that you're a masterpiece of his, that you are a child of God, an heir to the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't want you to feel like you're nobody and that you don't measure up to the people around you. Friends, you know it's the Holy Spirit convicting you of wrongdoing when the guilt and conviction leads you to Jesus. It leads you to repentance. It leads you to a changed heart and lifestyle. It leads to Jesus and to life and no regrets, or at least a life of forgiven regrets. And you know it's of the devil and of the world when the guilt you experience leads you away from God, away from loved ones, and it leads to pain and heartache, depression, destruction, and maybe even death. Godly guilt will always lead you back to Jesus. Worldly guilt will always lead you away from Jesus. Godly sadness will always lead you back to Jesus. And worldly sadness will lead you away from Jesus and the lifestyle he wants you to live. In verse 11, Paul says, Look at what this experience of godly sadness has produced in you. Such enthusiasm. What a desire to clear yourselves of blame. Such indignation. What fear. What purpose. Such concern. What justice. In everything, you have shown yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Paul points out that this letter of truth that hurt them and caused them to be sad for a little while has led to godly sadness, and that godly sadness has produced all these wonderful things in them. It has put in them an enthusiasm to change, to make their life, to make their church better. It has put in them a desire to clear themselves of blame. It led them to live in a more pure and blameless life. It made some indignant. And they wanted 
to prove Paul wrong. In others, it produced fear. What if Paul is right? What if some of the things that we're teaching are not correct? What if some of the things we're doing are not pleasing in God's eyes? What if we actually deserve punishment from God because of the wrong things we're doing and teaching and, and living? And it produced a godly fear in them. And a godly fear always keeps us from doing evil and, and trying to do what is right and pleasing in God's eyes. For others, this letter of truth reminded them of their true purpose in life and reignited a flame inside them for living a purpose-filled life. Others, this letter caused great concern and a desire to address these concerns. This led to a change of heart and a desire to live a more godly life and maybe even led to some changes in the church. You know, when people bring up concerns to, to me about you know, something happening in the church or a ministry or whatever, we usually try to address those concerns and make that ministry better or make the church better because we address those concerns. And I think the Corinthian church did the same thing with Paul's letter. He said some of the things he points out are true and they concern us and we need to correct these things. So hopefully it made the church a better church because the concerns were lifted up and brought to the light. Still others, this letter led to them wanting justice. They wanted to correct the, wrong do, the wrongs that were done. The wrong things in their church, they wanted to correct. Maybe they even wanted to bring that justice to, into their community and into their culture. They wanted to make sure those truths, those, those truthful way of living, those truthful teachings, were lived out in their church, their community, in their culture, in their world. I can only pray that when we experience godly sadness, that, we, that it has the same result in us. That it leads to us to, uh, to have to an enthusiasm to change. That it puts inside us a desire to clear ourselves of all blame and a desire to live a pure and godly and blameless life. That it leads to godly fear and repentance. That it reignites a passion inside us for our true purpose in life, to love God and to love others. I pray that godly sadness would lead us to live just lives and to pursue justice in our world. That'd be in our homes, our churches, our communities, our nation in this world. May we who follow Jesus Christ learn the difference between godly sadness and worldly sadness, the difference between godly guilt and worldly guilt. And may the sadness and guilt you experience lead you to Jesus lead you to repentance, lead you to a changed heart and a changed life so you become the person that God wants you to be. And may it lead to a life where you have no regrets. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful that you gave us life. But we're aware, God, that we now live in a fallen, broken world because we brought about the fall. And now we live, among, we live in a fallen, broken world, living amongst fallen, broken people. And there are things that are, are done or said that hurt us, that cause us pain, bring us great sadness. There are things that we do and say that, that, that we regret because we're not living up to the standard that we, we have set for ourselves, and, and it brings us sadness. God, may our sadness and guilt be godly sadness and godly guilt. And may it lead us back to you and back to the life that you've called us to. Back to a life of love and grace and mercy and truth and kindness and generosity. A life that is lived out, that is pleasing in your sight, that brings a smile to your face and joy to your heart. God, please don't let the sadness that we experience in this world lead us away from you. Don't let it ruin our relationships with family members and friends and people who love us and people that we love and care about. Don't let the sadness lead to depression. God, there are so many people in our world that are struggling with depression, and I pray, God, that you would come to them and, and bring joy to their lives again and, and help them to work through the things that are in their life that are bringing about that depression and, and may their sadness turn into godly sadness. It leads to repentance and new life through Jesus Christ. 
God, help us to be aware that Satan is trying to attack us and make us feel guilty and sad and to push us away from you, to push us away from all the relationships that bring joy to our lives and meaning and purpose to our lives. Let us not let Satan do that. But let us handle sadness and guilt in an appropriate way that leads to you and that leads to life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every Sunday we take up an offering, um, and there's usually a plate back there. I don't know if a plate got put back there today or not, to be honest. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, couldn't see it. And, uh, so, all right. So anyway, for those that are here, you can always put your offerings in the plate as you come or as you go. For those of you who are worshiping online, there are several ways you can give as well. You can give online. Um, just go to our website, sjfirstumc.org, and you can donate there. Uh, you can also send a check through the mail, or you can stop in the church. Anybody can stop in the church anytime and drop off a donation. Your donations are greatly appreciated. They help us continue to get the word of God out to the people in this community and, and all over the world. Um, your gifts help us do the Mercy Fund, which helps lots of people with financial crises. It helps us do our ministries and missions. So I hope that you give, and give generously and give joyfully. Um, your generosity makes a difference in people's lives. And also, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, during this next song, you're going to be invited to come up. The communion elements are at the prayer rail, at the communion rails here. You're invited to come and, and just kneel at the rail or stand at the rail and take a bread and remember what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross. Take the juice and drink and remember that the blood of Jesus Christ was poured out for you because he loved you. You know, we talked a lot about sadness today, and, and I, I know if you read the scriptures, you see Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with his disciples, and, and he goes off, and, he, and he's praying, and he's crying, because he knows the pain and heartache he's about to endure. But he also knows that, the, that his death and his resurrection is going to bring in the new way to be saved, and that billions and billions of people would be saved because of what he did for us on the cross. And he tells his followers, remember. When he takes that meal, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat the bread and drink the juice and do it in remembrance of me and what I'm about to do for you. And now 2,000 years later, we as followers of Jesus Christ, we still remember what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross. And I hope you're still thankful. And I hope you're still grateful. And anybody can come. We, we do open communion here at St. Joe First UMC. Anybody who wants to draw closer to Jesus and wants to have a meal with Jesus is welcome to these tables to eat and to drink. And I pray that as you take the bread and as you take the juice, I pray that you'd also take Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life and find that new life through Jesus Christ. So during the song, you may come and, and, and take, partake. If you need gluten-free elements, they're over here on, to, the, to my left, and you can have, have the gluten-free elements that way. But come during this next song. Thank you. So lay down your hurt, lay down your 
hope for the hopeless and all who strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your faith. A wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your heart, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are, there's joy for the morning. Sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. Jesus, we have gathered here today to worship you because we love you. But we know that you first loved us, and no greater love has anyone that he's, than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And you laid down your life for us so that we could be saved and so we could find new life through Jesus Christ. So we wouldn't have to lead a sad and depressed life, but we could have hope and joy and love and meaning and purpose. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've given us. But most of all, thank you for the gift of you, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, the gift of life. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close out with one more song, and I hope you sing it with joy and know that you are loved by your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Andrew, would you lead us in this our closing song? Absolutely. Please remain standing because as we leave today, remember where the battle belongs. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to you. <clears throat>